want to show you the process of veneer grafting, which is, in this part of the world, one of the principal methods by which we propagate tropical fruit trees. The, the veneer grafting method, interestingly, was developed in South America for cinchona, the plant from which quinine is obtained. And what you need for that method is very simple. You need a grafting knife, you need a rootstock plant, uh, preferably a nice, young, straight seedling growing in a pot, uh, in, and in a condition of active growth, I might say. That's always an advantage. You need some kind of wrapping material, and we very much prefer this um, sheet, th this uh, strip plastic. Uh, this is a, uh, a polyvinyl plastic. We prefer this to polyethylene because it doesn't stretch and break as, as easily. Uh, and the, the plastic, I might say, has, has revolutionized grafting uh, in, in the whole tropics. Uh, not only does it make a waterproof wrapping and, and protective agent, it lets oxygen and, and carbon dioxide pass through the, the plastic film, and so we don't get fermentation of the scions under the, the wrap and so on. Uh, so, and, and that's all you need. So here I have the scion, which I just cut a while ago from a mango tree in the field. And <clears throat> we talked some about that in the field, but I'll repeat it. You want scions that are mature, that is not flimsy and brand new, uh, but, but still green, and on which the buds are beginning to swell. And it, that may be difficult to see uh, where you are, but there, there are little buds clustered around this place where a, a flower cluster used to be, and they are starting to grow. And I want to show you a few things about choosing avocado budwood or graftwood. Uh, let me explain a, a couple of terms first. Uh, the piece of plant material that's used to graft onto something we call the scion, and it's also called budwood or graftwood. Uh, the plant onto which it's grafted is called the rootstock. So I want to show you about choosing scions on an avocado. Uh, I'm fortunate enough right here to have uh, an avocado tree that is not blooming heavily, although we're picking, choosing this during bloom time. You want to look for scions that are not blooming and that are fairly straight, like this one is, and that have leaves that are pretty well expanded and are hardened off, as, as we say. That is, they've become firm. They're not very limp like brand new leaves are. So I'll cut off the scion and trim the leaves off. We always do that to prevent the leaves from sucking water out of the stem and, and evaporating it away because the, the graft wood won't last nearly as long uh, if you leave the leaves on it for a while. Uh, so there is a, a, a very nice, straight, well, slightly curved scion, uh, a good one. Uh, now, let me show you something else. This shoot here that I'm holding is, is not good. Let me break it off, and I can, I can show you clearly why. I'll cut it off. It cuts better than it breaks. You see the buds on this scion. I'll pick the leaves off so you can see it clearly. The buds have already... Uh, grown and, and are making little new shoots. You see the terminal one there that's, that's reddish brown and these lateral ones that have leaves on them. Those are too far, uh, too far extended to make good graft wood. The uh, three of the three scions there, the one on your right is, is the worst one. It's the one I would not choose at all for grafting because the buds, both the terminal and, the la and all the lateral buds have grown out too much. And, and a graft like that is not very likely to be successful. And even if the graft union does form, the buds are, are apt to fall off. Uh, the, the, the two on your left are the ones that are much preferable, particularly the one, on the, uh, the one in the middle. People always want to know how to go about selecting scions or, or buds to do grafting. Uh, and, and we've, we've come here today at a very favorable time. We're, uh, 
a month to month and a half after bloom time, so the blooming is passed, and we don't have to worry about the picking signs that are going to bloom right away. And what I've got here is a twig on which the leaves are mature. That is, they've, they've stiffened up, uh, and, uh, they, but they're not senescent yet. And there are, I'm going to have to cut this sign to show you this, so I will do so. Uh, the, and and what, what we do first is, is cut off the twig, and, and I'm making what we call a terminal scion in that I'm using the, the buds that are at the tip or terminus of the twig. We cut off the leaves and generally just leave a very short stump of the leaf petiole as we cut them off. Uh, and, and this is essential. You want to do this right after you cut the scion because if you leave the leaves on, they're going to transpire a lot of water away and dry out the scion and they'll cause it to die rather soon. Now, here is a finished scion and it has little buds just starting to grow. Actually, the terminal bud is gone on this one. It, it was a bloom cluster and which didn't set any fruit, so it's already fallen off. And the little lateral buds, which are clustered at the tip, are starting to grow. This is a scion that's, that's really at just the right stage for grafting because the buds are already in active growth. And so if we make a successful graft with this, uh, it's going to start growing right away. And we're not going to have any trouble making the buds grow. Sometimes that's a problem to grafting. If the buds are too dormant, then you have a hard time forcing them into active growth. And you take this scion, and I'm going to trim away a little the base of a of a bud petiole there so I can make a nice shallow cut down the side of the scion. Uh, I'm making it about two and a half inches long and you can I think see where I've cut away that that thin layer. This is why it's called veneer grafting you see because you've just taken off a little veneer strip of bark and a little bit of the wood a little sliver of the wood and then on the other side I cut it off in the form of a wedge so that I've got a scion with a with a thin veneer cut on one side and a, a, a wedge cut on, on obtuse wedge cut on the other side now I want to get the rootstock ready and I'm going to take off some leaves here which I might not do if I weren't trying to show you clearly what I'm doing because you want to leave a, a, enough leaves on the rootstock to sustain it while the graft union is forming. I'm going to get rid of these leaves here. Now, I want to make on the rootstock a very similar veneer cut to what I have made on the scion, uh, which I shall do at this time. Now, it's, it's this rootstock, I think you can see the bark is still partly green here. You don't want it old and hard and, and too corky. This is in very good condition, really. It could be greener. You could make the graft up, up here where it's perfectly smooth and green. Here, it's a little bit rough, but it's still green. So I'm going to make the cut, and then I'll turn it so you can see it well. So I'm, I'm making this shallow cut, and I'm making it approximately the same length as the cut on the scion, you see. So here, here we have stock and scion uh, with similar veneer cut. See what I cut off the the rootstock here, this little veneer piece. Now, I fit the scion onto this cut. I'll, I'll hold it this way so you can see uh, how I've fitted it together. And then forgive me because when I wrap it, I'm right-handed, so I'm going to have to hold the scion with my left thumb. Oops, it's, it's slipping on me. And I start the wrap. And then I make sure that the scion is in place. Uh, that is so that the, the cambium layers on the scion are as best as possible lined up with the cambium layers on the rootstock. And then I start wrapping from the bottom upwards with each turn of the wrap overlapping the previous one by about a third. And then it, it, how I finish the tie depends upon the time of year. Right now, it's pretty warm, and 
I'm afraid that this that these buds are going to start growing very rapidly. So I'm not going to wrap clear over these actively growing buds at the terminal. I'm going to stop the wrapping here. Now we tie it off in this way. I hold my my fingers and keep a loop in the loose in the tape, and then I turn the, the end, the free end under, and then I pull it tight. And so you end up, you see, with a neat <coughs> wrap this way, with the end, with the, with the active buds exposed here, so they are not covered with the plastic. If you cover them with the plastic and they start to grow, they're going to get all bunched up under there and make the stems crooked, and, and the graft may, it may die, it'll certainly be distorted, and either way, it's very undesirable. And so that's the finished veneer graft. And then, <coughs> subsequently, we wait until a new shoot starts from this most active bud here and let it grow out a ways. And usually, by that time, then we'll start cutting back the old top of the rootstock because we don't want that to, to stay on there. And we, so we'll cut it back part way first and let this thing keep on growing. And, uh, Eventually, as soon as this the rootstock grows up to a to a good sturdy size, then we'll cut back this. I mean the scion. As soon as the scion grows good and sturdy, then we'll cut back the rootstock right back to the point where the graft union begins, and then it's finished. Then it then this will heal over and make a very nice graft union, and so you've got a brand new tree with with a particular kind of root. I should say a couple of words about this aftercare of grafts. If, if the, bud, the buds on the new scion grow out immediately, then there isn't really any problem. Then, as quick as they start to grow out well, I like to cut off the terminal bud of the rootstock just so it doesn't inhibit the growth of the scion. And, and enough said, I think, about that. Uh, a, another point is that I like to leave the, the main stem of the rootstock as a support in case the graft starts growing crooked or we have a lot of wind problems, we can uh, support the, the new scion, the tender new scion, with this tougher stem of the rootstock. Um, and and a, a further point is that if the buds on the scion don't grow out right away, then you've got to do something to force them to start to grow. Now, frequently just cutting back this terminal will do that. Other people prefer to, to bend the scion over and, and often partly break it. I, I mean, bend the rootstock over, the, the, the shoot of the rootstock, and that has the same general effect. It takes away this apical dominance of the rootstock on the bud of the scion. So you can do it either way. I prefer cutting, but some people like to bend them over. I want to make a further comment about the veneer graft. I, a lot of things of tropical plants have not received a great deal of research in the world. And often, when we first start grafting tropical plants, we'll find that they're difficult to graft, and we'll lose a lot of graft. And the main thing that I can say in support of the veneer graft is that it works very well with a great many species. And, and that's probably why we seem hung up on veneer grafting in Florida. It works. And we think it works partly because we're using a large scion instead of a very small scion, which I'll show you when we're demonstrating budding. And there's enough stored carbohydrate material in such a large scion to sustain the life of the scion for a long enough period for the graft union to form. And that has not been proven as abundantly as we would like to have proved it for everything. It's been shown very clearly in some tropical plants. But that's what we theorize is happening. And so that, in our opinion, is why a veneer graft is such a good universal kind of graft. If we have a universal graft, it's the veneer graft. But we do other kinds as well, which we will be talking about here. And to demonstrate a cleft graft, I'm going to cut some more leaves off this rootstock. Uh, and what you do here is to cut off the, the whole stem of the rootstock. Just cut it away, discard this, because it's no longer any use to you. 
then you need to, I'm just trimming off the, the bases of the leaf petioles here, you need to make a, a split, a cleft, in the rootstock. And you need to make it right down the center as, as nearly as you can. Do this carefully because uh, when you're using a, a stock that's a little firm like this, if your knife slips, you're going to cut yourself and, you, and, and it'll hurt. Uh, then I would actually prefer to have a scion a little smaller than this, but this is what I've got today, so I'm going to use it. You want to make a wedge-shaped scion. So I'm making a cut on, on one side, and then I'm going to try to make a very symmetrical cut on the other side so that I come up with a, a perfect wedge. With you all watching me, it won't be perfect, I'm sure, but uh, it'll be close enough. So, so here I have, I'm, I'm making a second cut there. That's called whittling, and it's bad for grafters, but <laughs> I've had to... So, so you see what I've got here. I've got a very sharp pointed wedge with all these buds up on the terminal end of it. And I've got, uh, I'm going to make this cleft cut a little longer. And so I set the wedge right down into the cleft, you see, like this. So that the whole cut edges, the, the cut edges of the cleft are covered by the, the, the matching cut surfaces of the, of the rootstock. The cameraman is zeroing in very closely on this graft to show that, in this case, the match is not perfect, that if, if we just uh, tied this thing up without tying it tightly, there would be air showing between some of the parts. That's very undesirable. You want the, the, the scion, the cut edges of the scion, to be in very intimate contact with the cut surfaces of the rootstock. Otherwise, you can't get a good graft union to form. Uh, and so we want to show you what we do to prevent there being air spaces in between the scion and the rootstock. So now we're going to wrap this thing. And, and instead of using the plastic, as I have been using on the other kinds of grafts, I'm using a rubber band. You see, a very flexible rubber band. And I can put considerable pressure on this rubber band, as I am doing here, uh, and I am pulling the, the rootstock pieces right up tight against the scion uh, so that you have to take my word for it because you can't see through there now, but so there isn't any airspace showing between those things. And then I, I tie it off the same way as I do the, the plastic wrap. So here we have the scion. Let, let me, perhaps it uh, shows a little better from this side. The scion is sitting down in the cleft here, the wedge-shaped scion. This is a typical cleft graft, and uh, it's tied tightly with a rubber band. Now, if, if the weather were dry and cool, so this thing isn't going to grow very rapidly, uh, we, we might either wrap over this with plastic or set a plastic bag over it, a little plastic bag, and, and tie it with a twist -em. Uh, most nursery people are going to do their grafting in warmer weather, and for the most part, they don't have to do that. They don't have to cover this thing. They, the, the, the rubber band doesn't form as good a waterproof uh, covering as the plastic wrap, but it's good enough because these are young and rapidly growing tissues, and so they form a union quickly. So like as not, uh, most nursery people would just leave the graft this way, and uh, in, in most cases, it'll be successful. And it'll start, you could expect a graft like this in warm weather to start growing in, in three or four weeks. Uh, in cold weather, it might take uh, several weeks longer than that to start growing. Put it in the shade. That's the best advice, yes. We already discussed out in the field some of the aspects of cutting an avocado scion but I'll repeat a couple just for your sake. I, I'm going to do a cleft graft, and for a typical cleft graft, as we do it in, in South Florida, you need scions which are fairly young but, but hardened off and in which the buds have, are not starting to grow out very far. 
uh, and as I say, we already said that. Now, the, the most important criterion that I find is to have them at, at the proper physiological stage, and I'm going to cut away the outer tissue here so you can see the pith of this cyan. Uh, the pith of the cyan, the, the pith is this uh, soft inner tissue of the stem, and, and you all have seen pith in a sunflower stalk or uh, something like that. Anyway, the pith must not be dry and white. It must be greenish and moist and in active growth. And, and this is, uh, I can't overemphasize how important this is. If you use avocado cyans that are too old for cleft grafting, you're not going to have success. So f for goodness sakes, uh, cut some of them and look at the pith and see that it's nice and green and moist and you can be sure then that you've got it in the right condition. Now what I'm going to show you is the cliff graft technique for avocado as we use it in South Florida. This has really become the method used by our nurserymen more than any other. Veneer grafting can be used, but we have switched over almost entirely to cliff grafting of young avocados in the nursery. Now the seedling I have today is a little bit smaller than I would like. This one is not quite as big around as a lead pencil, and I would prefer a seedling about the size of a lead pencil, but this one will do. And what I have to do, as with the mango cleft graft, is to just cut off the rootstock this way. I've just cut it off with a cut straight across, and here's the top, and I will discard that because we won't use that anymore. Uh, now, and the second step then is to make a cleft cut right down the center of the rootstock as long as the make it the same length roughly as the wedge that you're going to cut on the cyan. And we take the cyan, and this is this nice, tender, young cyan, and make very carefully, because this is tender tissue, make a long wedge cut, first on one side, so, and then on the other side. Uh, and this takes some practice. Our nursery people get to be very good at this, but they, they don't get good instantly, <laughs> I tell you that. So, so here, yeah, here I've, I've just about got it now. I've got a little sign, just, just a little thing, uh, and, and cut in the form of a sharp wedge with cuts on each side. And so all of this, all of this pith tissue and cambium tissue is exposed, and this is all meristematic tissue. It, it's actively growing tissue. And I fit the wedge, the cyan, down into the cleft of the rootstock. I'm going to cut that bud away just because it doesn't look neat. And uh, so here's what it looks like with the wedge sitting in there. And then obviously, as we talked before, I'm going to bind this thing together with a rubber band again so that it's held tightly together. Uh, this is the secret of all successful grafting is, is binding the, the cyan and the stock tissues together tightly enough so that they're in very intimate contact but not so tightly that you damage any of the tissues because that, that's really bad. You don't want to smash these things because these are little tender plant parts, don't forget. Hey, George. Uh, and, uh, boy, I mean, there. Now, I've, I've tied this thing together. Here's the little plant. Uh, now, you'll ask, how, how do you care for this plant after you've made the graft? One thing that you can be sure is going to happen is that there will be buds sprouting from the rootstock for a while. And, and it's Im this is important. When you see those little buds sprouting from the rootstock, go in there with your thumbnail and pinch them off uh, before they get toughen toughened up. Because if they're tough, then you'll have to go with a knife and cut them. And it's a lot more trouble. And they're a lot more likely, you're a lot more likely to damage the young growing plant. So, so for three or four weeks, watch them closely, pinch off the little shoots, 
and by that time the cyan will be growing nicely this this ought to be growing in in two or three weeks and by the time five or six weeks are gone you'll already have a little tree starting the, the, with the cyan starting to branch it's a it's a neat technique it, it works beautifully it's a it's a nice nursery technique and usually another another nice thing is that this rubber band is photodegradable and so and we're doing this out in full sun by the way some do it in light shade others do it in full sun and and by the time the graft is growing well many times the rubber band will have degraded and fallen off so you don't even have to go back and cut off the rubber band in some cases they won't fall apart as quickly and you may have to go in with the point of a sharp knife and and cut it off so it falls away and doesn't uh, bind the the growth of the new plant but uh, it's it's a, a a very nice technique along the line uh, as i was saying uh, this this rubber band frequently will degrade by itself and you won't have to cut it off the plastic that we use for other types of grafts on the other hand does not photodegrade very fast and and it doesn't degrade near fast enough to fall away from a graft uh, without damaging the graft if you don't cut it off so after the graft is has grown well and the plant is well established, then it's a good idea to go in and cut off any plastic that hasn't already uh, fallen away. Uh, don't leave it on there because it'll girdle the stem of the new plant and you'll regret it. Occasionally, fruit growers want to change the variety of the trees in their orchard. There are various reasons for this. They, they may want to change to a new variety that has just been discovered uh, market demands change uh, various things uh, we're looking at an avocado grove uh, th with a form of grafting that we call top working the grower cuts back the trees and then when new shoots come out uh, he grafts the new variety that he wants onto the shoots and then and, and make sure that he cuts away the suckers or, or shoots that come out from the old from the limbs of the old variety uh, and it's a remarkably rapid technique they can bring trees back into bearing in a very few years because the large root system of the old tree is still there and it and it forces tremendously fast growth of the new graft uh, this is a, with avocado, it's a fairly common technique, and with mango, it is too. Uh, it's not used as much with some other fruit crops such as citrus, but it, but it works very nicely. The grower has used what we call a veneer graft here, and he, he has done it on a shoot that's come out from the old cutback limb. They cut back all the limbs at the same time here. We use that as, as our regular procedure. And then when the new limb gets, the new shoot gets large enough, uh, buds are taken from the desired variety and grafted on here with, as I said, a veneer graft. In the past, we used to use a cleft graft in which the stump, the cut stump was split uh, and and scions were cut uh, were inserted into the splits. It was a more difficult technique uh, that did not work as well as as this veneer grafting. So we've almost entirely gone to veneer grafting for top working away from cleft grafting. Just avocado or all three? This we we don't use cleft grafting of old stumps for any florida now uh, the biggest problem was was the the skill required to do the cleft grafting uh, the fact that it was more trouble and the fact that it failed more often and and so those factors all taken together caused us to to switch over to this different t type of grafting the question comes up uh, as to how many kinds of fruit trees can be changed over by top top working this way I've mentioned avocado and mango particularly this can be done with citrus we don't generally do it with citrus because sometimes often there are systemic diseases in the old citrus trees and and all you do is propagate them into the new 
grafts when, when you do this. So it, it may be a case of knowing too much <laughs> instead of not knowing enough. But So we don't generally use it with citrus. We generally take out the, the undesired tree and put in a new tree. Uh, with most other things, we have not used top working, but it may only be because uh, we haven't had them in as, as wide a commercial production as avocado and mango, because it certainly can be done with things like carambola, uh, with anonas, and so it, it depends on the crop, but it's a, it's a technique that is pretty generally useful for woody tropical fruit trees, yes. The, and, and I would drop back a moment and say that mango had always been considered difficult to graft, almost impossible to graft in the early days when it was grown in, in this part of the world, uh, except by the approach grafting method. Uh, Long ago in India, hundreds of years ago, Akbar, the great Mughal emperor, had a, an orchard of more than a thousand trees of mango grafted by the approach graft method. The approach graft method is, is a sure method, but a very cumbersome one, in which the, the plant that you're using for the rootstock, upon which you want to graft a desired variety, is put up next to a mango tree growing in the field, and, and twigs from the mother tree are, are cut in such a way in, with a veneer cut, which I'll show you in a moment, and the rootstock is put up next to the shoot on the mother tree, and it has to be set on a scaffold so that it can be supported, and it has to be watered, and so the scion is left on the mother tree uh, until the graft union forms, and only then is it cut away, and you can see that that's a more sure method because then the scion doesn't die. But it's a terribly cumbersome method. And for nurserymen in this country, they have neither the time nor the patience uh, to, to do it that way on a really large scale because they're selling trees by the thousands and thousands. So uh, a second kind of propagation that we use commonly for mango in, in this part of the world, in Florida, and, and people in other places use it as well, is the called a chip bud. And it has several advantages. One particular advantage comes when you only have a limited amount of graft wood to use, uh, and you don't have any way to get any more. And what you can do in that case is cut <coughs> scions that have rather long internodes. They've, they've grown rapidly, and they, the buds are spaced rather far apart as they are on this one. And what you're going to do here is make a scion out of each single one of these buds. So you can see that I can get one, two, three, four, perhaps five uh, buds out of this stick instead of just using the terminal and having only one scion. Uh, and what you do in this case uh, is use rootstocks, preferably that have smooth green bark. Uh, I've taken off the leaves up here. Preferably, you'd use a little younger rootstock than this, so you wouldn't have to cut off so many leaves. But this one will do fine. And I'm going to cut the scion and show you how I do it. I make a shallow cut, starting maybe three quarters of an inch above the bud, and cutting down to a half inch or three quarters below the bud in a straight cut, a shallow cut, and then as, as with the veneer graft, cutting off the bud with a notch. So you see I've, I've just left this much behind. and So what I've got is a very small scion with a single bud, very thin, uh, cut flat on one side, and then with a little sharp wedge cut on the lower end. And uh, as with the veneer graft, I want to make a similar cut on the rootstock, which I shall do, and, and then show it to you. You see, I've cut, again, a veneer cut here and cut a little transverse cut at the bottom, leaving a little notch there. And so then I take this little scion and I fit it into the notch on the rootstock. You see how neat that sits on there? And uh, then I take 
In this case, I'm using a narrower band of plastic than I used for the veneer graft, uh, but it's the same uh, polyvinyl plastic wrapping tape, and uh, I'll do my best to do it so you can see it here. I start the cut, uh, the, the wrap, I'm sorry, not the cut. Uh, it started at the bottom, and I'm wrapping upwards. The reason I'm starting at the bottom and wrapping upwards is so that each successive wrap laps over the, the previous one like a shingle, and if water runs down the stem, it'll be shed off without going in under the wrap. And I wrap right up to the leaf scar that is underneath, the, that is below the bud, and then I have to leave a little gap above the leaf scar so that the bud is exposed, and then I'll have to wrap one turn downwards to, to cover that adequately, and then I take a couple more turns above the bud, and then I do the same way. I, I take a, a loop in the plastic and stick the free end through the loop and draw it up tight, and there you have it. The, the cyan is tightly wrapped into that little veneer cut on the cyan, oh, on the rootstock, I'm sorry, I keep confusing the two, and the bud is exposed so that when it starts to grow, it'll be able to grow freely without the plastic binding it. With this kind of bud, many times it is rather difficult to force the bud. If you, if you pick dormant buds to start with, they may not start growing easily. The first thing to do is to, is to cut off the, the terminal of the rootstock, and usually that will force it. You may have to cut it back more, more sharply, though, to force it, or you can bend it over, as we have discussed previously. Now, a thing that we could have done, however, before we ever cut the budwood is, is to prepare the budwood ahead of time. If the buds for, for chip budding, here's a good example with them well spaced on the stem, uh, if these were very dormant and not getting ready to grow, not swelling, we could have gone out, say, 10 days to two weeks before grafting and cut off the leaves off of this terminal sign while it was still on the tree. And that would have caused the buds to start growing and to swell. And, and this is a trick that, that grafters use a lot, and, and it works very well. So I recommend that to you. I want to talk about the methods we use for grafting, for, for grafting citrus. Uh, actually, we call it budding, which is a specialized form of grafting because the cyan contains just one bud. And therefore, when you hear people saying they're going to bud citrus, that's what they mean. They're using that small cyan. I want to make a comment on, on why we usually propagate citrus by budding. And I guess the simplest way to say it is that budding works, and, it, and citrus is easy to do, so you don't have to resort to some of these more specialized kinds of things like veneer grafting to make citrus work. It's a, it's a very simple thing to cut enough buds from a citrus tree to bud hundreds of trees, thousands of trees sometimes from a single tree. You see, I can get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven buds off this little stick, and I can make eleven trees with it, uh, each one, each on a rootstock. So uh, we do it because it's, it's a very easy technique, and, and it works very well. Now, I'm going to show you there, there's two things we do, to two kinds of budding we use for citrus. And uh, I, I have this nice rounded budwood here. What I've got is, is buds of Tahiti lime, and I'm budding them onto a rootstock of sour orange. Now, there's, a, there's several points to be made. One of them is that the choice of budwood is important. What I like is budwood that, on which the bark is still very smooth and green, as these are that I'm holding in my hands. Uh, not corky at all, not rough and not brown, uh, but well, well rounded, uh, and and that we're going to have to use a, a close up probably to show you that. But I'm going to cut buds from two sections on this bud stick, as we call it. Uh, we cut the bud for citrus budding in just the same way as we do for chip budding of mango. Oops, uh, that one didn't cut so well. Let me cut another one. 
You do it with a smooth cut right down underneath the bud. This illustrates what I wanted to show. The bud on your right was cut from a well-rounded part of the bud stick uh, so that the, if you cut, a, cut the twig in cross section, it would be quite round. Uh, and you see that the cyan that results, it's got a single bud in the center, and it's a fairly broad cyan, and if you could see it from the side, you'd see it was flat. The other one was cut from an angular part of the twig, of the bud stick, and it's narrower, and uh, I just, you just have to take my word for it. I, can, I guarantee you it's harder to manipulate than that nice flat bud and, and when you go to lay it down on a, on a flat cut on the rootstock, it's harder to keep it lying flat as you make the, as you bind around it with plastic. And so the, the, the bud from the rounded part of the twig is much better than the bud from the angular twig. Sometimes people have to use the angular twigs because it's the only bud wood they have. And in that case, you just do it and you manipulate it as best you can. But if you have a choice, Take the rounded butt wood. You're looking at now at a, at a nice, smooth, rounded piece of bud wood. And I consider that very good for cutting buds, for lime or for any other kind of citrus. And the one that is in view now is the opposite. It's an angular bud wood. You see, you see how flattened those twigs are and how grooved they are. It's much harder to cut good buds from a, a stick like that and, and to graft it. I cut the bud here, and I'm going to do a chip bud first. <laughs> I've dropped the bud. Uh, but here I have it, and it's prepared just as you saw shortly previously, this little scion with a single bud. Now, I go to a, to a section of the rootstock that's got nice green bark, and I make a, a little veneer cut, or chip cut, I guess you would say. See, this is why it's called a chip bud. You cut away a little chip of bark and discard it. And then, and, and I, th I hope you can see this nice little cut here where the white of the surface of the wood is exposed. So I've got this tiny scion with a single bud, and I've made a little chip cut on the rootstock and you can see the, the white of the exposed wood. So I take the chip and I fit it into the little notch that I left at the base of the cut on the rootstock. And then taking a little strip of plastic, as I like to use, I bind over the bud. Again, oops, so I'll have to, I'll have to start again. I've slipped. Uh, starting at the base and, and wrapping upwards, I cover over the bud, and I like, I like, as I said before, to leave a little gap so the bud can, can grow if it's, if it's in very active growth. So I'm, I have to, you're not seeing this well, I'm afraid, but I've left a, a little gap there, and then I tie off the plastic with a single loop and there is the completed chip bud. Now, I want to show you a second kind of budding. And, and probably uh, it's best to consider the one I'm going to do right now first. And that is a shield bud. Uh, that's the, probably the commonest kind of bud used for citrus. Uh, first, let me show you the shield bud, and then let me comment on an alternative type that you can use. For a shield bud, we're cutting the, a, a very similar scion to what we cut for a chip bud, and we end up with a little scion that is, uh, I, I just made a flat cut right underneath a bud, and I end up with a, a little piece of tissue that has one bud and it's shaped like a shield, like a long narrow shield. Uh, I'm going to make this cut down low. Uh, a nurseryman in the field might well bud a little higher. 
First, I'm going to make just a straight cut in the bark, vertically in the stem. So that's what I've done. Just a cut right through the bark down to the wood. Now, I'm going to make a second cut, and that's going to be a crossways cut at the top of the vertical cut that I made. So I've got a cut that's, that's in this form, in the form of a T. And that's why this is called T budding as well as shield budding. Uh, some people prefer to make the cross cut at the base of the vertical cut, and therefore it's called an inverted T. I like to take the tip of the knife and you spread the bark apart like this. So we've made the T-shaped cut. We've spread the bark apart at the top. Now we take the little scion. I like to use it between the thumb and forefinger of my left hand and slide it down into the T-cut and I use either my thumb or sometimes the point of my knife to, to slide it down under the bark. And if the bark is slipping, that is, if the cambium is in active growth and the bark separates easily from the wood, this little scion just slides in there like it was greased, and you end up with a, a very beautiful placement of the scion sitting here with the bud exposed, but the edges of the scion nicely covered with the bark. And then, as with every other kind of graft that we use, I take a, a piece of plastic budding tape, and I start wrapping at the bottom again, and I wrap up, lapping over as I go, and I uh, leave a little gap for the bud to grow, and I wrap on up to the top, and then catch a loop with my fingers and pass the tip of the tape through the loose end and tie it off. And so we've got a shield bud. Now, it, it needs to be said that sometimes the bark isn't slipping on your rootstocks and you don't have time to fertilize them and get them growing actively. And so when you try to make a shield, a, a tea cut, and slide in a shield bud, it won't slide in and the bark will break or it won't separate. And so you can't do a shield bud well. Then is when you want to do a chip bud. And you remember we saw that with the chip bud, you make a veneer cut. So you just cut off a, a thin slice of the bark right down to the wood. So you're not depending upon the bark separating from the wood, you're cutting it away. And so the chip bud is a very useful kind of thing uh, in a situation where the bark isn't slipping. And some people just get to liking chip buds so much that they use them all the time rather than tea buds or, or shield buds. Uh, so that's really the reason for using chip buds in place of tea buds sometimes with citrus. And these two methods, chip bud and tea bud, or, or shield bud, which is a synonym, are the two kinds of ways that we graft citrus most commonly in Florida and also in a lot of other parts of the world. I should comment that if you wish to do citrus with a veneer graft, you could do so, but I don't know any good reason to do it because the budding is so much easier, and it, and it's, and it uses so much less bud wood. This has been a, a, a rather brief <laughs> coverage of the subject of grafting. It's really a vast subject. And there are many variations of grafting. Many different methods are used. Some highly specialized, some very unspecialized. These four methods that we have gone over, veneer grafting of mango, cleft grafting of mango and avocado, uh, and chip budding and shield budding of citrus, are four of the methods that I have found to be the most universally used. And, and some of the very best basic grafting methods in the world. Uh, and, but, but always remember that if you run into troubles, uh, seek advice, go to the literature. There are some, some good works on grafting and budding methods of some tropical things. So uh, you may find the need to use something more specialized than this, but probably not. If you know how to do these, you can handle almost anything. Uh, the question comes up, how long can you keep budwood? How long will it last? 
uh, say you're taking a trip. Well, let me say a couple of things about it. The very, very best thing to do is to hand carry the budwood if you can. I have lost budwood scores, perhaps hundreds of times, sending it through the mail and had it sit in some post office and become hot and dehydrated and ruined. Uh, so, so if you can, visit the place that's the source of the budwood and cut it yourself or have somebody cut it for you and package it yourself. The best way is just to put it in a plastic bag and close it up and don't put a bunch of wet stuff in with it because it'll mold nine, uh, eight times out of ten at least. Uh, so put it in a plastic bag and, and close the bag tightly and carry it yourself. Uh, and you can expect graft, uh, graft wood to last for differing lengths of time. Citrus wood you can refrigerate in an ordinary refrigerator at say 42 degrees Fahrenheit, roughly 40 to 42. It'll last for weeks. Uh, mango budwood shouldn't be kept below 50 degrees if you can help it. And uh, you're going to be lucky if it lasts more than a week and a half or so. Uh, avocado graft wood is about the same way as mango. Perhaps it'll last a little longer. I have seen it kept refrigerated. Uh, you, actually, there are some varieties you can keep in a home refrigerator for several weeks. So it varies. But my rule of thumb is if I possibly can graft within a week, I do it. And two or three days is better, and one day is better still. Uh, the faster, the better. Uh, and one other thing I would say about root stocks. Uh, if I have a rule of thumb, it is to use the same species of plant as a rootstock as I'm using for a scion. That is, put loquat on loquat and avocado on avocado and mango on mango. With citrus, it's much more specialized than that as it is with apples and some things. There are many different rootstocks of different species and, and uh, each one is tailored for a particular soil. So with citrus, you need to get some specialized advice about that. But in general, if you have to make a choice, graft a species of cyan onto the same species of rootstock. That's the best advice I can give, I think. I like to do grafting with a grafting knife. Uh, many people tell me that they have problems learning how to sharpen a grafting knife. And I want to show a couple of general principles about that right, right at the start. This, this knife I'm holding is a stainless steel knife made specifically for grafting by a Swiss company called Victorinox. Uh, purists will insist that carbon steel, which is subject to rusting, is better ultimately than stainless steel, but I find these stainless steel knives that are made specifically for grafting are quite satisfactory, and in a humid climate like Florida, they don't rust all the time, so they're, they're well worth getting. Now, when you first get a grafting knife, it's not apt to be uh, nearly as sharp as it needs to be for, for good grafting. So what I like to do is start out with a usually a carborundum stone. Uh, and I use a fairly good sized one. And it has two sides on it, a, a coarse grit and a fine grit. And you can see, I think, the dividing line between the two. And if the knife is pretty dull, I will start out with the coarse side and then follow up uh, for finer, to give a finer edge with the fine side. That's logical enough. Uh, I always like to stroke the knife across the stone against the cutting edge. And I think this is, for, for most of us who sharpen knives, this is the way we prefer to do it. And so you want to start out taking, let's say, a few strokes, say five, on one side of the blade, and then do the same number of strokes, again, against the cutting edge on the other side of the blade. And do this for several times. It, it may take you a half a day. I hate to discourage you, but that's the way it is with sharpening knives. Uh, but it, it usually takes me a couple of hours to work down a new knife. Uh, and, and it takes just patience and, and doing it evenly on each side. Then, 
I'll, I'll turn it over and usually then you don't have to spend so much time on the finer side of the stone and again and and as I get a better and better edge I'll take a lesser number of strokes on each side till I get down to where I'm doing one one way and one the other uh, the way a barber strops his his razor if you've ever if you're old enough to remember that and uh, anyway and then after I've finished with the carborundum stone and done as good an edge as I can, you can use the knife for grafting at that point, but it's not the best edge you can get. And then I like to go to a finer stone. This little one I'm holding is an India stone, and it's a, this one is a quite fine one, and I will uh, finish off the edge uh, in this manner with this fine India stone and uh, testing the blade every once in a while to see if it's really sharp. There's various ways to do that. Some of us who still have a little bit of hair on our arms will uh, test it by shaving off some of the hair and you probably got the end of my thumb uh, to test the edge and I just carefully uh, pull it across the edge and if it catches on the uh, surface of my skin why then it's sharp and if it doesn't if it just slides across ineffectually well then it's not sharp be careful of that I mean people <laughs> you may see the end of this thumb that's that's uh, carved up a little bit it, uh, I use this as the as a thing to cut against and, and many people do not approve of that but those of us who use knives a lot do that and and we do it routinely and, and it doesn't seem to do us any permanent harm but, but you must be careful with these grafting knives. They are not toys. They are sharp, and they will cut you in a twinkling of an eye if you're not careful with them. Uh, a, a, another, a further word about grafting knives. This is a two-bladed knife, and this, this one blade that I was showing you how to sharpen is called the grafting blade, and it has a flat edge all the way from the heel to the point. The other one is called a budding blade, and it has a curved blade, for a curved more out on the end uh, towards the point than it is towards the heel. And I'll show you as we're doing budding and grafting uh, how, they're, how they're used differently. I, I like this knife very much because it's got both kinds right in the same knife. However, there are other kinds of knives. This one is just a budding knife, and it's a nice little short one. It used to have an ivory little spatula on the end here, which I cut away. Uh, some people like to use that in citrus budding when they make the first cut, then they take this little spatula and, and spread the bark apart so they can slide the bud in. Now, that's a waste of time to me. I, can, I make the cut and then I spread the bark apart with the point of the blade and I, I save one whole motion and so I think it's more efficient. But this is a very nice little knife made by Schrade Walden in the United States. Uh, another knife which I like very much is made by Case, and it's a, it's a, a stationary knife. It doesn't fold like these other two. Uh, you want to be careful with one like this. You can't stick it in your pocket and carry it around, or it'll do you bodily harm. Uh, I carry a little, a little paper sheath that comes with the knife and keep it in that so I don't cut myself or ruin the edge of the blade. These are the cheapest, the, I should say the least expensive, uh, graft, quality grafting knives that you can get. One like this will cost probably nine or ten dollars, nine to eleven dollars nowadays. Uh, one like this Victorinox with the two blades will cost twelve, thirteen dollars now. A low, uh, considered a low cost grafting knife. You can get Swiss models uh, that are with carbon steel that cost thirty, thirty-five dollars without any trouble at all. And, and, and they are very fine and I own a couple but I'm a knife collector and I just love to have good knives. But this one here, this $12 model does grafting essentially just as well. Uh, I should mention a couple of other things. One of them is that some people prefer a grafting knife that is flat with a blade that's flat on one side and beveled on the other. And, and this knife that I'm holding is such a knife with both budding and grafting blades. It's flat on this side and it's beveled on this side, and I don't know that you can see that, but when you're, gra when you're sharpening it, you'll lay the blade flat on the stone, on the flat side, and you'll hold it up at, at more of an angle on the beveled side. 
and huh. and what this mean and and but when you when you get a knife like this, it means that you've got to get either a right-handed model or a left-handed model because when you graft, you you want the flat side down against the the bud stick when you're cutting the bud. And so if you're left-handed, you're going to have to have a knife that's beveled in the opposite direction as this right-handed model, because I'm right-handed. Uh, and it's like this Schrade model that I showed you before are beveled equally on each side. And I'll, I'll show you a little, a little thing about that. I, I like this one for certain kinds of grafting because it's equally beveled on each side. Um, and, well, I, I, can, I can tell you simply enough, when you're making cliff grafts, with very tender young seedlings, so tender that they're easy to ruin. Uh, if you use a knife that's, old, that's, that's uh, beveled on one side and flat on the other, it's hard to cut an equal, a cut right down the middle of a tender little seedling like this. But with a knife that's beveled equally, it's easier to me to make the, the, the cleft cut on, on such a seedling. So that, to me, is, is reason enough to use a knife with equal beveling on each side. This is a specialized business, you see. <laughs> uh, now, another thing that should be mentioned is that some people just throw up their hands and they tell me, I'll never learn how to sharpen a knife. I don't want to. To heck with it. And those people prefer to get something like an X-Acto knife, which is a little aluminum handled thing with a chuck on the end of it and, and a blade that fits into a slot in the chuck. And, and so you can change blades, and you can buy them with extra blades, and the blades come pre-sharpened, uh, just like surgeon scalpels do nowadays, and, and they're very similar to a little scalpel. And, and these people prefer to do that because the blade is already sharpened, and they just put it in the handle and tighten it up, and off they go grafting. Now, the, the problem with that comes if you are like me, and you graft a lot of different kinds of things, and you get to grafting some something with very big, very hard science, macadamia is an example, or large mangoes, or something like that, where the wood is hard. And if you're cutting into the wood, then some of these things like exacto knives or little single-edged razor blades mounted in the in a handle of wood, which some nurserymen use, are are kind of weak. They they bend, uh, and and they don't. That they're not as as good for cutting heavy stuff as a as a good stout knife like this bound into a strong handle, and so for heavy duty grafting, I very much prefer some substantial grafting knife. But you you still can use these other things for almost any kind of grafting, and some people do. Some pros, lots of pros do. So I want to point out uh, these bright uh, aluminum foil wrappings that there are on some of these limbs here by me. Uh, Dr. Tom Davenport is doing some work with air layering of, of mango as a means of propagation. I want to make it clear that we are not recommending this as a routine method of, of propagating mango. It works, but we don't know any important advantage to it as yet as a commercial technique for either home yard trees or for commercial trees. Uh, what Dr. Davenport is trying to accomplish here is to produce trees that are groups of trees that are genetically identical for some of his flowering research. And this is very important. Uh, you, you can imagine that, a, that, a very, that, that an, an extremely similar population of plants is, is much better for doing experiments than a population that is variable uh, because the trees have been grafted on genetically variable rootstocks. Uh, so, that's the reason for doing this work with uh, mark cottage or air layering. Mark cottage is a, is a synonym of, air of the term air layering. This is a technique in which a girdle is made, a ring of bark is, is removed from a limb, and some, something like sphagnum moss, moist sphagnum moss, is wrapped around the girdled area, and then the whole thing is covered with aluminum foil to keep the moisture in, in the moss, and roots form at the point where the girdle is made around the limb. And uh, th this is a, this is a time-honored, really ancient method of, of propagation of plants that was developed uh, ages and ages ago in China, called Chinese air layering sometimes. Uh, and, and it's used for a great many plants, but it is not used commercially 
for mango propagation. I, I, I want to emphasize that. We, we use air layering by choice with a lot of different ornamental plants, such as crotons and uh, aurelias and, uh, oh, various foliage plants. Uh, uh, and it's also used in acid citrus fruits like limes and lemons, used very, very, very well commercially. Uh, what other fruits do we use it? We, we use it in guava. It's used some in macadamia nut, not, not as much as grafting in macadamia. Uh, it's, it, it's a rather, a rather adaptable technique, and, uh, but, but some plants don't respond well because they don't form strong roots. Uh, it's, used, it's used routinely in lychee, for example, because lychee plants made by air layering form a very excellent root system. But, but some other plants, the, the mango is one, don't form as strong a root system from air layers as they do from seedling plants. And so we don't favor air layering at this point. It's a fair question to ask why one would choose to p produce plants by air layering instead of grafting or even vice versa. Uh, and, and it's not a simple thing because some plants are better propagated in, in one way, and some plants are better propagated in the other. Uh, one decided advantage of air layering is that you can get a rather large plant quite quickly because you can girdle a large branch on a tree and get root, root formation and then cut that branch off and plant it in the soil. Uh, and off, usually we plant it in a container and put it in a protected area until the root system develops a fair amount and then we set it out in the field although some people will set the plants directly in the field and that works if you're willing to water them very well and not let them dry out but anyway so you can get a, a large plant quickly the the disadvantage of that of course is that if you're using large limbs you can only get a certain number of plants from a given tree and in if you're grafting or budding for example and taking just a a tiny bud uh, for each plant that you that you graft, well, you can get literally thousands of plants from a from a single tree when you're taking the buds from that tree. Uh, so, and and uh, another point that might be made is that I already mentioned that some plants from made by air layering grow very vigorously, and others do not. We find an interesting advantage of air layering lime trees, for example. We grow Tahiti limes in South Florida as a commercial crop, an important crop to us. Plants made by air layering grow a little slower and are a little smaller for a given age than plants made by grafting on vigorous rootstocks. And we consider that an advantage because once a plant reaches a certain size, there's no real advantage in its being taller and it's harder to, to control diseases and it's harder to harvest the fruit and so we prefer to have rather small trees. And, and you all know about how apple growers and other fruit growers in other parts of the world use dwarfing rootstocks to produce dwarf trees. Dwarf trees have many advantages. Uh, so, and, and un unfortunately, we do not have true dwarfing methods for any tropical thing that I know about. Uh, we are looking for such things, and I have every confidence that we will find them, but it's it's going to take a while. There are so few people working in tropical horticulture relative to the numbers working in, in deciduous fruit horticulture that it's quite a contrast, and we are way behind. We are rather in a primitive state, I would say, of, of horticulture with tropical fruits. This is well known to everybody who works in the field. Um,
One of the most important tropical fruits in South Florida is the avocado. This is this and the lime are the two most important ones we grow here. We've grown avocados for a long time. Florida and California are the two pioneering places of avocado production in the United States. We grow avocado varieties here in South Florida that are much different from the ones that are grown in California. Ours, there are two racial types that we grow. One is called the West Indian and the other is called the Guatemalan and we grow a good many which are hybrids of those two races and those make up pre predominantly our commercial crop. We also grow avocados of the Mexican race here in home yards but not as a commercial fr fruit. I'm holding in, in this, my left hand, on your right, uh, two avocados of the variety Booth 8. This is a hybrid between the West Indian type and the Guatemalan type. And in my other hand, I'm holding a typical West Indian fruit of the variety Peterson. And as I, I showed you already, the skin of the West Indian type is smooth and shiny and leathery. And the skin of the Guatemalan type is rougher. And I think you can see the, the, the little, the pebbling of the surface. I, I've always thought that the, these pebbled rough-skinned avocados were the ones that caused people to call avocado the alligator pear a long time ago, the likening the skin to the skin of an alligator and the dark color to the color of an alligator, perhaps. Anyway, this, this booth eight has a thicker skin, a woodier skin. It's not as flexible and leathery as the West Indian type. The West Indian has a lower oil content uh, than, than these hybrids, and as I already said, Hybrids that include the Mexican race have even higher oil contents. Well, and, and to put it in perspective for you, this Peterson uh, at, at maturity would run uh, six, seven, eight percent oil, percent fat. And, and it is, it's present in the fruit as, as a liquid fat, therefore it's called an oil. Uh, the Booth 8 would have uh, 16, 17, 18 percent oil and the Haas variety or the Fuerte variety from California would have uh, the possibility of, of 22, 23, 24, 25, 26 percent oil. Just to give you a, a, an idea, there really are significant differences between these different varieties in oil content. And uh, fortunately, as, as I understand avocados, uh, these fats are, are not the kind that are going to do you a great deal of of harm, and, and on the contrary, they, they are quite uh, nutritious, so we, we feel that avocados are good food. Now somebody asked me how one could go to the store and look at avocados and tell the difference between Florida avocados and California avocados. Well, there's, there are many, it's a, it's a complicated picture again. Florida sells a great many varieties. We have 50-some varieties on our official maturity schedule, which governs the harvesting of avocados. Part of the reason being that our avocados have a short maturity time, and once they get mature on the tree, they drop. On the other hand, California markets ar across the country only about five varieties of avocado. And this is possible because their avocados, being of different racial types, are capable of hanging on the tree a long time after they get physiologically mature so that in a sense the Californians can store the fruit on the tree which is a tremendous economic advantage to them as I'm sure you can realize. Anyway, the California varieties have quite small fruit. The, the principal variety now that California sells is called Hass, H-A-S-S -S, and it's a little black avocado when it's ripe and very rough skinned, uh, pear shaped and it's a very fine avocado I might say uh, and it, it is, uh, it, it looks quite, it, it's, it's considerably smaller than most of the Florida fruits you'll find on the market. Now the Florida picture is quite different from that because our avocados have many shapes and many sizes. They tend to be large. Uh, th this one that I'm holding, this Peterson, is one of our smallest avocados. These Booth 8s that I'm holding are not mature, so they haven't reached their full size. They would be roughly the same size as this Peterson if they were mature. 
but many of our avocados are, are much larger than this. We have some varieties such as Pollock and uh, Choquette and Monroe, which are three to five times the size of this Peterson avocado. And we have one variety called Marcus, of which I have had fruit that weighed uh, five pounds and more. Uh, we market some of those, not a lot. Most of our avocados would run from, from the 16 ounce to say 30 to 36 ounce range. Most California avocados would be only a few ounces, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten ounces in that range. So the California avocados will be much smaller uh, and they'll generally be marked as California avocados too uh, because they, they use this as a marketing strategy. Uh, our Florida producers don't tend to use the name Florida, I think, as much as California has used. The tree that I'm standing by is a tree of the West Indian race called the, the, by the varietal name of Peterson. And you, you perhaps may be able to note that it's a small tree. We consider that to be a great important thing. Uh, the smaller the tree, as long as it produces a good crop, the better off we figure we are because it's easier to harvest the tree and to take care of it, uh, spray for diseases and so on. Uh, many of our avocado trees, however, are very large. This causes us some production problems. We have to spend some time pruning our trees. We're, we have a good deal of research at the Tropical Research and Education Center on tree efficiency and on ways of dealing with this large size of tree, on ways to reduce tree size without completely wiping out tree production. Uh, avocados are like many other tropical fruits, mangoes for example, in that they bear their fruit on young growth, on new branches. And when you prune off those new branches, it goes without saying that you have to wait until some branches are replaced before you get more fruit production. So this is why we're putting some emphasis on ways of controlling tree size now. Uh, the avocado has some other production problem. Uh, for those of you who aren't too well acquainted with an avocado, let me cut one here and and show you how, how the thing is constructed. Uh, the avocado botanically is a very specialized berry, uh, which probably is not of great importance to you. The avocado fruit has one seed, and the seed is what we call a gametic seed. That is, it's always formed by cross-pollination, and therefore trees grown, plants grown from the seed don't come true to the mother variety from which they were taken because they've got the genes of another variety there from the pollen. So this means, as with many other fruits, with the majority of other fruits, you've got to graft the trees or, or do some other form of vegetative propagation to get them to come true. So all of our orchards here are of grafted trees. Uh, the West Indian types particularly have a leathery skin. You see the skin that I've peeled off. It's, it's flexible and leathery, a little uh, delicate, easily damaged. The West Indian avocados have to be handled carefully. Uh, they have this, th this particular variety has the disadvantage that the seed is quite large in comparison to the entire fruit. Uh, some people take advantage of this by putting little books out, telling people how to grow avocado plants in a, by putting the, suspending the seed over a glass of water, and, and that's fine too. It makes good recreation for people who don't live where you can grow avocado trees outdoors. Uh, the pulp of the avocado is, for those of you who don't know, is smooth and, and buttery, and this one happens to have a very nice, rich flavor, nutty a little bit, uh, probably not as nutty as the Mexican Guatemalan types of California, but uh, people here uh, like to advertise our fruit as being low fat, which it is, uh, and therefore being less uh, inclined to put on the pounds when people eat a lot of it. So they, they advertise that you can eat more Florida avocados without getting fat. <laughs> that, of course, to many people in the world is not a problem, uh, having too much food, uh, and quite, quite the opposite, and, and we all recognize that. The avocado is a, is, a, is a good fruit that is very much appreciated in the American tropics. It's not nearly so well known in Asia because it didn't come from there, and uh, 
we always laugh a little when, when we see people in Asia, such as in the Philippines, eating avocados with milk and sugar because we usually eat them with salt and pepper and, and oil and vinegar and things like that as a salad fruit. But, but you know, this is just a matter of, of what you are accustomed to. Uh, and avocados can be used for ice creams and for guacamole mixes and, and in all sorts of ways, uh, added as chunks to soups and, and oh, we, we, have, we have a myriad ways, way of using avocado. Um, what else can I say about the trees? They're, except for the root rot, they're relatively easy to grow. And, and that's uh, another thing in their benefit. They can be planted by people under fairly primitive conditions and grown well and serve as a source of good nutrition. They have, they have a fair amount of fat, a little carbohydrate, uh, some protein, more protein than most fruits, which could be an important thing to some people. Uh, we don't eat the seed, by the way. The seed is very astringent. Insects eat the seed, but people don't. Uh, and to my knowledge, nobody in this country utilizes the seed in any way. In some countries, it is said that they grind up the seed and, and char it some and use it as an adulterant for coffee. I cannot attest to that personally, uh, although people tell me I have drunk coffee <laughs> that contained it. So uh, probably that is true. Yeah. I should say something about the adaptation of avocados. And it's a very complicated picture because of, this, uh, of the different races of avocados that there are. In general, the Mexican, the Mexican avocado is well adapted to highland areas in the tropics and to cool subtropical areas. And it's quite tolerant of frost. It'll, it'll survive temperatures down in the mid-20s, even low-20s, uh, some varieties. And so the Mexican avocado is a, is a cooler area plant. The Guatemalan avocado is intermediate. It can be grown up to some fairly high elevations in the tropics, but it doesn't tolerate near as much frost as the Mexican type. And the West Indian type, on the other hand, is a lowland adapted avocado, best adapted to the lowland tropics, and it tolerates very little frost, and it's uh, easily damaged uh, when you try to grow it in, in even in cool areas where there isn't much frost. So it's not adapted to cool areas. And then, as I have already said, in talking about varieties, there are hybrids of all these types, every combination you can think of, although I guess Mexican-West Indian hybrids are ver would be very rare. Uh, mostly they're Mexican-Guatemalans, which are adapted to cool weather, and Mexican and, and Guatemalan-West Indian, which are adapted to warmer areas. And so you can find avocado varieties for almost any kind of a climatic, of a temperature climatic condition that you could find in the tropics. Uh, from, from sea level up till seven, eight, nine thousand feet elevation, and from a fair amount of frost to, to just steamy hot conditions all the time. The, there are other considerations, and that is they're not well adapted to too high a rainfall because of root rot particularly where the soils are heavy and poorly drained, but that's, that's another thing. Temperature-wise, they have a tremendous wide variation depending on the varietal stock that you choose. A very important thing to say about avocados from a practical growing standpoint is that they don't tolerate flooding or wet soils very well. I always tell people this. Uh, if you have wet waterlogged areas you, you ought not to plant avocados in them because the trees will die. And, and the cause of their death is a disease called avocado root rot. It's caused by a fungus called Phytophthora. And this thing thrives in wet conditions. And there, there are now fungicides that are specific for this organism. And, and growers in some less than optimal places are using them, but they are expensive. And so if you don't want to use expensive fungicides, then you ought to plant avocados in, in very well-drained places. Uh, in South Florida, where most of the commercial avocados are grown, we have uh, limestone soils that have extremely good drainage and extremely good aeration. We have minimal problems from root rot there. But 
in any place where the soils retain moisture uh, badly or where rainfall is high or where there is flooding, avocados uh, are lost very easily. It's, it's, an, it's an important thing to remember in growing avocado. Carl, would you address whether you can just make a mound or not? If that, or do you have to have... You can, you can help to prevent root rot problems by planting avocados on raised beds or on mounds. Uh, and this, this works, and it, it helps a great deal. Uh, if you get flooding, however, it only has to be flooded for something like 24 to 48 hours to do major damage to an avocado tree. And, and as a tree, even if it's on a bed or a, raised, uh, or a raised mound, as the tree grows, its roots will get down out of the mound. You know, they, it, it, it takes a lot of area for a big root system and the roots that grow down into the lower areas will get root rot and they'll cause the tree to, to have major dieback sometimes even if you do plant the tree on, on a raised area. So uh, as best you can stay in well-drained areas with avocados because it's extremely important. I want to tell you something about the flowering of avocado. There are two types of flowering behavior in avocado. One, <clears throat> and, and they are complementary. It's called uh, by scientists synchronous dichogamy. And with, with all avocado varieties, the flowers open first as females, and then they close, and then they open a second time as males. And there are, as I said, two types of, of flowering behavior. One is called A and one is called B, just for convenience sake. And when the flowers of the A type are open as females, the flowers of the B type are open as males and vice versa. So that theoretically, uh, you need two types, the A type and the B type growing close together for successful pollination. Now, we find on a practical basis that A types can to an extent pollinate themselves and B types can to some extent pollinate themselves. So it is not absolutely necessary to have both types in order to get flowering and fruiting, to get fruiting. But uh, there, in many cases, there is a definite advantage to having the two types growing together. And this is why in commercial groves, you will often see uh, alternating rows or alternating groups of trees of A types and B types. Uh, for people on a practical basis with a tree or two in the yard, uh, you can probably ignore this and still get a reasonable crop. The flowers I'm holding are open as females. If you'll notice, the, the stamens, that's the pollen-bearing organs around the edge, are, are folded back and the pistil, the female part of the flower in the center, is uh, sticking up by itself. Uh, these flowers are of the Booth 8 variety, and they are open as males. And you will see that the stamens, in this case, are the, the inner circle of three stamens is sticking upright and, and very closely positioned to the pistil, and the outer circle of stamens is also more upright than they are in when the flower is open as a female. And the yellow organs that are down near the base of the stamens are nectaries. And they secrete nectar, which attracts bees and other pollinating insects. Bees are fairly important as pollinators of avocado. It, it's to be recommended to have bees if possible. You can get a crop without bees, but uh, they are a help. Unfortunately, if there are more attractive crops like citrus around, often the bees will abandon the avocados and go to the citrus. So this is a problem sometimes. Avocado trees have, uh, tend to lose their leaves at the time of flowering, either, either just before or in some cases just after. And we get at the experiment station where I work lots of inquiries about avocado trees at flowering time. People think that their tree is dying because it's losing its leaves. And I think it's worth saying, we, we always tell these people not to worry. 
that it's a normal occurrence with avocado and that the leaves will come out very soon, the new leaves. And indeed, as you can see here, right on the ends of the flowering clusters, there are new shoots coming out, new, very tender, young, reddish or greenish leaves. Uh, so, and so within a, a couple of weeks' time, this tree will be nicely leafed out again. So although we classify avocado as a, an evergreen tree, it is, in truth, briefly deciduous, briefly loses its leaves. 